right, so we've seen that there's different kinds of weathering, you know, your mechanical and your chemical, and then different kinds of mechanical and different kinds of chemical. And well, what about the rate of weathering? Like, how fast do different rocks weather away? And the rate of weathering is controlled by a number of different things. First of all, just the rock characteristics. For example, if you have a rock that has um, lots of holes in it or so, think about like vesicular basalt, right? It has all these little holes, that's a whole lot of surface area. So you would expect a vesicular basalt to weather faster than a massive basalt that doesn't have all those little holes in it, right? Because there's less places for water to get to in the massive basalt. So just the rock characteristics itself, how many cracks does it have in it? How much surface area does it have? But there's also the rock composition. And uh, we can see here, there's something called the Gold Edge Mineral Stability Series. And what this is showing is the rocks that are easiest to chemically weather down to the rocks that are hardest or take the longest to chemically weather. So one of the easiest ones or one of the, the quickest ones to chemically weather is olivine. And then it takes a little more time, but uh, it's still pretty quick to weather, is pyroxene. An amphibole, biotite, and then some of the hardest ones, or the ones that take the longest, are case bar, muscovite, and quartz. And hey, what does this look a whole lot like? And you guys, being brilliant students, should be sitting there looking at your computer watching this saying, it looks just like Bowen's reaction series. Olivine, pyroxene, amphibole. And what did we have when I was talking about Bowen's reaction series? This is the isolated tetrahedra. The single chain, the double chain, the sheet silicate, and then case bar and quartz are framework silicates. So what we're seeing is that um, depending on the chemical bonds of the different minerals affects how easy or hard it is to chemically weather those and break apart those bonds. All right, another really, really important one for um, the rate of weathering is climate. And climate includes, of course, temperature, but also precipitation patterns. Are we in a very arid area or are we in a place that gets a lot of rain? And I have a great example to show you how uh, climate can really affect uh, how fast things weather. These are two headstones from the late 1800s. In the late 1800s, headstones were um, fashioned out of a uh, white limestone. And I've already said limestone is very susceptible to um, dissolution. Well, this is a headstone from uh, 1882. So 1882, this is in Michigan. And I hesitated with the year because I can barely even read it and I had to try to remember what year it was. This is from 1887, very similar in age, but look how easy it is to still read all the words and see the, the carving on there. Well, that's because this is in New Mexico, which is an arid area. There's not as much precipitation, there's not as much rain, so there's not as much dissolution going on there. So climate can be very important in controlling just how much weathering occurs and how fast it occurs in different places. Now, because of weathering, we can have some very special um, landscapes or special structures created. So let's look at some of these special results of weathering. You can have something called spheroidal weathering. And this is where you start off with a very blocky shape, right? We have a cube here, but eventually through this special type of weathering, we're gonna get a round shape produced from that. And that's because the corners are going to weather faster than like the, the faces of it. And that's because there's more surface to volume ratio there. What I mean by that, here in the center of this area, it's only being weathered from one direction. But here on this corner, it's being weathered from this direction, this direction, and that direction. So those corners are going to weather faster. 
And that's why we can see things like this. This is practically at the top of Pikes Peak. There's like three feet above that, okay, maybe four. Um, so this rock did not come rolling from somewhere into that position. This was just sitting there, and it was a blocky shape to begin with, but you can see the edges have weathered off because of that spheroidal weathering. You can see that here as well. See how the, these are starting to get kind of a rounded shape? That's our spheroidal weathering. Now you can also have differential weathering occurring, and that's exactly what it sounds like. Different rocks weather at different rates. And so sometimes you'll create areas where you have cliffs and slopes. Well, let's look right here. We have two rock types. This is mudstone, and this is sandstone. Notice how the sandstone sticks up a lot more, and the mudstone is very rounded. That's because it's very easy to weather mudstone. It's much harder to weather that sandstone. We see the same thing here in, uh, in the Grand Canyon, where we have these cliff-forming rocks. Those rocks are very resistant to weathering. And where you have these slopes, those are easier to weather. Now, from differential weathering, you can also get things called hoodoos. And yes, that's a real geologic term, hoodoo. A hoodoo is a column or a pinnacle or a pillar of rock with like a weird shape to it. Uh, like what we see here at Bryce Canyon National Park or here at Bryce Canyon. These are my hoodoos, and they're formed by differential weathering where the rocks to the sides of the hoodoos weathered faster than the pillar or pinnacle that is sticking upwards. Now, in the American West, if you ever go travel out, like uh, drive west of Denver, you'll see a place called Table Mountain that separates Denver from Golden, Colorado. Uh, that's just one place I can think of. There's a lot of them. This is a place that exhibits inverted topography. And inverted topography is where you have a mountain or a hill that used to be the valley floor. Okay, so topography. That refers to the shape of the landscape, where we have hills and where we have valleys. Inverted means we've reversed things. So what was the valley is now the hill. Well, how does this form? This is really common where you have lava flowing into a valley. Lava is liquid, and liquids flow to the lowest point they can. So lava, being a typical liquid, flows downhill into the valley, that's what we have here, right? This lava filled up the valley there. It becomes solid. And once that lava solidifies, it is very resistant to weathering and erosion. So it ends up acting like a shield protecting the rocks underneath it. So over time, the hills that used to sur uh, uh, surround that valley get eroded away, but the rock that's protected by that lava flow stays behind. So what was the valley is now my hilltop. And that's what we're seeing right here. This is along the New Mexico-Arizona border. And right here, if you go walk to the top of that hill, you will see a lava flow. And that lava flow protected that hill, or the, what was the valley floor, and now it is the hilltop. All right, so from weathering and erosion, we get um, uh, regolith. Regolith is this layer of rock and mineral fragments that covers the surface and is produced by weathering. It's like what I showed you at Pipes Peak, right, where you had the solid granite, and then you had all those little bits and pieces. Regolith, right, those little bits and pieces of weathered rock. Now, this is different from soil. Soil is when we have that regolith, the little bits and pieces of the weathered rock, but we add, or nature adds, some organic material, there's gonna be some water, there's gonna be some air, and the vital thing is soil can support plant life. So we have this kind of combination of mineral material, organic material, water, and this allows plants to grow in it. 
and soils form on stable surfaces. And a stable surface means it's a surface where we don't have a lot of material being deposited, dropped off, but we don't have a lot of material being removed. We basically just have this stuff sitting there. That's stable. And these soils form from the surface downward. So if you have a very young soil, it'll probably be pretty thin. As the soil gets older and develops more, it'll develop downwards, getting thicker and thicker. And this soil development ultimately results in what we call horizons. Horizons are distinctive layers within the soil. And uh, they're going to have different colors, they're going to have different textures, some might be sandy, some might be really muddy. And uh, how these develop is because through soil formation, you get rain entering the ground, and that rain, that water kind of percolates downwards, it moves downwards through the soil, and as it does that, so it's a zone of leaching. Leaching means it starts dissolving certain elements, but it's also that downward moving rainwater is going to deposit different elements at deeper down and so over time you start getting these distinctive zones with different compositions that are the horizons so when you study soils um, you uh, you look at what's called a soil profile i used to work at a soil lab it was my one of my least favorite jobs i've had and I've had a lot of weird jobs but I really I, I don't like working in a lab I'll be honest um, but part of uh, what we did in the soil lab is we had to study soil profiles which meant going out in the middle of the desert and digging holes so we could see the different horizons so a soil profile is this vertical section through a soil that reveals all the different layers that we have now, what's shown on this diagram are all of the possible layers. Not all soils will contain every single horizon. So, the possible layers you might have is right here at the top you have this O horizon. And that's O standing for organic material. And uh, then underneath that you'll have the A horizon, which is some minerals, so some of that regolith, some of the broken down rock and mineral, and it's going to be mixed with humus, not hummus, humus. Humus is partially decayed organic material. So some of this organic material here gets kind of starts to decay a little bit and mixes with the A horizon. Together, the O and the A horizon are called the topsoil. And it's the topsoil because it's the top part of the soil um, profile, but it's also where most of the nutrients are contained. Now underneath there we have the E horizon, E for alluviation. Alluviation is the removal of small particles. And so in this E horizon we have this removal of small particles and we also have leaching, which is the removal of anything soluble. Well, these small particles and soluble particles, they get removed, but where do they get taken to? Not very far. They get taken to the B horizon, which is also known as the zone of accumulation. So this stuff that got taken out of the soil above gets dropped off in the B horizon. Underneath that we get the C horizon. This is partially altered parent material. The parent material is the rock or sediment that the soil forms on. And it's only when we get down to the C horizon do we actually, are we able to tell what that parent material was. We, we will start seeing little bits and pieces of limestone or basalt or whatever it formed on. And then all the way down here we leave the soil and enter unweathered parent material. All right, in the United States, hey, we're scientists, right? We classify things. Scientists love classifying things. And um, they, they classify soil. It's called soil taxonomy. 
and uh, this is done um, in the U.S. by the Department of Agriculture. And why by the Department of Agriculture? Because um, soils are really, really important in agriculture and growing different kinds of crops because certain crops will grow in certain types of soils. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture has come up with this soil taxonomy system. And basically, just like um, in, in plants and animals, you have different families of animals. Well, here we have different orders of soils. And you can see there's our different soil orders. I'm not gonna make you memorize those, don't worry. What I am gonna do is take a brief look at three different major types of soils just to give you an idea of how different soils can be. So we're going to start over here with this desert soil called an aridosol. And there you can see you don't really have an O horizon because there's not that much organic material to accumulate in the soil. And so you don't have an O horizon, you have a pretty thin A, you have a whole big B horizon where soluble minerals tend to accumulate. Now let's compare this to a temperate soil. A temperate soil would be what you'd expect to be forming in like, I don't know, Ohio or Michigan or Pennsylvania or someplace like that. We have our O horizon, probably because we have a nice forest or something above, plenty of organic material. There's our A. We also have enough rain to have an E horizon, right? You need water percolating down in the soil to have an E horizon. That's why you don't have one in the uh, desert soil. There's not enough water for that. But in a temperate climate, there's enough water to create that. And we have our usual B and C horizons. Now over here in the tropical soil called an oxisol, um, again, we don't have a huge O horizon. And that's because organic material tends to decay so quickly in a tropical environment, it doesn't really accumulate. And so we have this little thin A horizon and then this huge B horizon um, uh, because basically anything soluble gets washed away and um, uh, you get left with those iron oxides and things like that. Tropical soils are actually really terrible agricultural soils, um, mainly because they just don't have a lot of uh, nutrients accumulating in them. So that just should give you a brief idea of what some of these soil, different soils are like. What do they look like in real life? This is an aridosol. This is a desert soil where we have that accumulation of soluble minerals. This is a um, temperate soil. You can actually see some of the horizons in here, right? There's our top soil here, our O and A. There's this lighter colored E right there, and then we drop down the B horizon. And that is a um, tropical soil, off in Hawaii. And again, you can see there's not really a big, thick organic layer in there and just a whole lot of uh, iron oxides and other things accumulating in there. This is a buried soil. I just thought I'd put that in there because remember I said soils form on stable surfaces. So what this tells us, this was a stable surface for a really, really long time. And then a volcanic eruption came and dropped all this ash on it. And so now it's buried. So soils actually can also be used to tell us a little bit about geologic history. And this is a map of the United States where each of the different colors shows some of those different types of soils. Now again, I'm not going to make you memorize this, but I think it is kind of neat to see that even the dirt under our feet has lots of fascinating different characteristics and, um, and some of those characteristics makes, make certain soils really good for agriculture and other soils not so good. All right. So let's finish up by looking at the things that affect soil formation. There's five things. One is going to be the parent material, right? The parent material affects how fast things weather, how much they break apart, how chemically reactive the elements inside are. Uh, it's going to affect the chemical composition of the soil. Right? If you don't have a soil with any iron in it, you're probably not, or you don't have a parent rock with any iron in it, you're not going to get a soil with any iron in it. 
So the parent material ends up being really important for your um, uh, chemical composition of the soil. But slope is also important. Soils tend to uh, get better developed on flat areas than where you have steep slopes. Just think about it. If you have a steep slope, every time it rains, a little bit of material will get washed away. And so your soil just won't be able to develop as thick. Time. Time is really important. It's not like I have barren rock outside today and tomorrow I wake up and I have a meter of soil there. You know, it takes time for all of these chemical reactions to occur, for the organic material to build up, for these things to actually happen. So time is vital. Soils need time to form. And then we have biologic activity. Remember the O horizon, organic material, it's part of the definition of soil? Well, depending on the biologic activity in the area, you will get different amounts of organic material there. And then I put this together with climate because climate's also going to affect the biologic activity. But climate also affects the amount of rainfall that you have, the different types of chemical weathering that you can have. And so you will definitely see very, very different soils if you're in a temperate climate versus a desert versus a tropical climate. And so really one of the most important things that affects the type of soil you get is going to be climate. Because no matter what parent material you have, no matter how much time, no matter what the slope is, you're never going to get one of these oxisols developed in a desert environment because you just don't have enough rain to form that. And you're not going to get a desert soil forming in a tropical environment because there's too much rain for that. So ultimately climate is really the vital thing that's going to affect the soil you have in a location. Um, so there you go, the summary of our five main things that affect soil formation and our random picture of the day. That is me with a sledgehammer breaking apart rocks. This is up at a mine in uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula of Michigan. It's an old copper mine. Why am I breaking apart rocks? Because sometimes that's just the thing to do. You know, when you just have a bad day, just go break some rocks. It takes a lot of frustration out. Actually, there is a real reason I'm doing that. It's good exercise. And in those rocks, sometimes when you break them apart, you'll be able to find like little copper crystals or little agates. And that's what I was looking for. And yes, I did find some there.